Funny that 17 years after beating that first game, we're kind of back right where we were, huh? <laughs> Kingdom Hearts 3 just released, making its arrival 13 years after Kingdom Hearts 2, a game which was also heavily anticipated for what at the time seems like a very long four or so years. Kingdom Hearts 3 boots, and immediately as a fan of the first two games, it's hard not to get caught up and a little emotional in the ways KH3 continues Kingdom Hearts tradition, as if the over a decade of waiting had never happened. The title screen is once again a minimalistic bit of concept art with another new rendition of Dearly Beloved playing over the top. A pre-rendered CGI music video with insane production value once again kicks in with a brand new song from Hikaru Utada, unlike the spin-off titles that used the songs that debuted in games 1 and 2. This time a whole new track is here to distinguish this game as the next mainline entry into Kingdom Hearts after so long. It's confident and it says, yes, here we are, we're back, it's happening. To me at least, at the same time, KH3 is kind of masquerading as this ultra-important game that needed to happen and we've been waiting for, rather than authentically being one like KH2 was when that came out. Kingdom Hearts 1 ended on a downer of an ending, which in and of itself could have stood alone as this kind of bittersweet tragic conclusion, but there were definitely interesting loose threads and room to continue. Chain of Memories built on that with a real big downer of a whole game that raised the stakes and set up more intrigue. The build-up to KH2 was crazy. It felt like a game that needed to happen at that point to give closure to the first. It wrapped up that game's arc perfectly, brought things full circle, and ended with some definite bit of sweetness while giving a satisfying conclusion to the mission set out for us in that first game. By the end of Kingdom Hearts 2, it felt super satisfying to have completed the goal that Sora was trying to accomplish in the first title, especially when it seemed like the chance of that happening for him was so low after the end of the first game and the wait between titles. Kingdom Hearts 3, on the other hand, for the most part, isn't continuing or wrapping up anything that happened in those games. It's continuing a bunch of stuff that was made up and added on after Kingdom Hearts 2, and how important this game's premise is to you is going to depend on how much those those titles meant to you. Anything here quote-unquote continued from KH2 feels like additions made to already completed arcs rather than organic continuations, which makes this kind of a 13-year wait in name only in some ways for me. It's not here to conclude anything from Kingdom Hearts 2 that already concluded its arc. Sora and Co get a letter at the end of that game, but to me at the time all that implied was, oh, these guys all went on a series of further adventures, a nice little addendum, but nothing I necessarily had to see. They could have been solving a tax dispute in Agrabah for all I knew. And no, I don't think an unintelligible secret movie is part of the story that needs to be wrapped up. Don't start on me. Kingdom Hearts 3 isn't Kingdom Hearts 3 because it's a follow-up to Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. It's Kingdom Hearts 3 because it's a new big mainline console Sora, Donald, and Goofy adventure. And yes, we haven't had one of those for 13 years, and taken on those terms, yeah. This is a pretty exciting game, even for me. After the opening and the traditional esoteric tutorial level, we're thrust into the action surprisingly quickly, unlike the slow build-ups we got in KH1 and 2. Now, there was this sort of Ground Zeroes prologue released a few years ago, which I didn't play, about the character Aqua going through some fights in a dank, darkness hell world, which I wonder if that was intended originally to be the opening to KH3 and was just released early. After all, if playing as Roxas for a couple of hours at the start of KH2 was an excellent analog for the few years we spent waiting for KH2 to come out, playing as this character being stuck in a miasma of darkness and despair for a decade would have probably made for an even more fitting analog for the wait leading up to Kingdom Hearts 3, if it had been used for the start of this game. But alas, it wasn't meant to be. KH3 still tries to elicit something akin to the feeling of a delayed start like KH2 did by branding the first level where Sora returns to an older Disney world from prior games as 
Kingdom Hearts 2.9. And then after that, when he gets his new clothes and goes into newer worlds, it becomes Kingdom Hearts 3. But it feels a bit half-hearted compared to how 2 handled that sort of thing. It's hard to see the Hercules world as some kind of not actually Kingdom Hearts 3 level when it clearly is. It only takes one more level with Sora receiving a smartphone for the 13 year gap between titles to become really noticeable. Kingdom Hearts 2 came out in the mid 2000s, just before broadband internet would become a household staple in the late 2000s. And before smartphones, when we were still using our advent children flip phones, baby. So seeing Sora take selfies and make Instagram posts now is really uncanny to see, but at the same time kind of inspired and appropriate. I mean, Kingdom Hearts back in the day was trying to be Disney, but with cool modern Tetsuya Nomura related Final Fantasy esque characters with audacious fashion. Trying to be hip and modern was always somewhat its aesthetic, so it fits to update that with social media references here now. I like it. That's some sort of spyglass? Probably French, eh? I also like the different reactions characters have to the technology. Speaking of tech, this game looks great. Graphics and detail were blowing me away, and can I just say how far it feels we've come from the Dark Realm, quote-unquote, that was the 7th gen where so much stuff ran like crap? KH3 looks great, and even on a base PS4 can run at an uncapped frame rate and can reach even a smooth 60 on better console models. That said, <laughs> with today's impressive visuals and detail, and a long development cycle, and since this is a big follow-up to an old franchise, which traditionally have been known to come out a little undercooked, <laughs> we gotta ask that good old diminishing returns question. Was the scope of this game compromised thanks to the need for extreme modern detail and cost of long development like so many games today? Tallied up, it doesn't feel like the game is compromised that much, at least when it comes to the main quest. And that bare minimum is nice to see. Uh, the main storyline feels meaty, and like it's all there. 30 hours, about the same length as the other two main games. Twilight Town are smaller, but then you get crazy worlds like Pirates of the Caribbean, where Port Royale is big and open and you have an entire mini Wind Waker style setup to go exploring in. It's great. It feels like there's a bit of a trade-off going on in some regards. You get these cool massive levels, but the game feels a bit naked without really any kind of nice, comfortable, juicy hub worlds to call its own, when 2 felt like it had multiple of those. The game doesn't benefit from better hardware just graphically. There are much fewer load screens. Levels can be sprawling and huge, but movement is fast and fun enough on its own to never make traversal much of a drag. These levels definitely feel like something that couldn't have been accomplished or at least anywhere near as smoothly 13 years ago. And since Kingdom Hearts games have been designed for handheld since 2, it's quite a leap to suddenly see a series floating around on 6th generation at best tech for years, suddenly jump to modern home consoles and make the most of it, without compromising too much on performance. Though what does feel very Generation 6 about this game is its PS2 as hell design philosophy. You drop out of beautiful cutscenes and go to town on your enemy with outlandish and unrestrained moves. Big cutscene style attacks with limited interactivity are usually optional. Control isn't forced out of your hands for cinematic posturing or something like the dreaded walking segment. Sometimes you just gotta play a PS2 franchise about Disney Worlds to get away from that in your action games. But when Kingdom Hearts does get a little more scripted, it leans into the language of games rather than out of them, not pining for cinematic style immersion. It uses the game's HUD, the command deck, to contextualize every bit of context-sensitive pre-scripted action, as if every one-off event was just another move in your repertoire. And beaterers of this game will know what I mean when I say a certain late-game shmup-like sequence is the stuff of legends thanks to this stylistic choice. For me, intertwining elements like the HUD into context-sensitive moments lessens the disconnect between flashy set-piece or cutscene and basic gameplay, rather than making it larger, which I don't think most modern games agree with me on. I won't show any examples of that kind of modern game, because I don't really want to annoy anyone today. You know, if you've seen enough of my videos, you can probably picture one for yourself at this point. Uncompromising gaminess in Kingdom Hearts is why it's actually kind of great seeing properties like Pirates of the Caribbean adapted for it. Because in this context, rather than some kind of grounded, restrained affair, a serious game version of this IP would likely end up like these days, you get this really fun, completely outlandish, gamified interpretation of Pirates of the Caribbean that cuts down on busy work for crazy, fast-paced action. What other pirate games let you do this? Come on.
Nowhere, though, is the sixth generation design exemplified more than in the final hours. I was super worried that the ending would be disappointing, but the last five hours of KH3, the final stretch leading up to the finale, the final area as a whole, so to speak, was, well, it's like the best final five or so hours I think I've played in a game since the PS2 days. I don't say that lightly, and I think the rest of the game leading up to it can be kind of hit and miss, but... Hmm. This finale. I have wanted something like this again in a game for so many years. Another descent into uncanny, esoteric Kingdom Hearts anarchy that KH1 and 2 did so well at their end is brilliantly executed here again. The bosses at the end of the game were so much fun. I was so giddy thanks to these climactic scenarios that were taking place and the beautiful boss theme medleys that were playing, courtesy of the amazing Yoko Shimomura soundtrack, which as usual is one of the best parts of any Kingdom Hearts game and lends itself perfectly to that ever-present melancholic action feel. Pianos and violins and boss fight music, it's just always good, I'm sorry, it just is. <laughs> All of this created an amazing finale that didn't seem to skimp on anything gameplay-wise, with one climax one-upping the one that came before again and again. It's paced exactly how I dream of action game finales being paced. It's so beautiful. The way the final moments of the final boss fight ends, especially with the classic trio coming together, it nailed the kind of wholesomeness in the face of darkness that Kingdom Hearts does so well. A real throwback to the first game's finale. It made me feel like I was playing the end of a classic PS2 title again. And in that sense, whether or not this game is wrapping up anything I specifically care about doesn't really matter, because it delivered on that, giving me an amazing action conclusion that feels like it's from a classic game from the era its early predecessors came from. Rather than being like a lot of modern games, something that looks pretty while skimping on the gameplay substance because there was not enough time to fully recreate the scope of past entries, KH3 at its conclusion and throughout a lot of the game manages to bring back the meat of what we loved before and enhance it with today's production values. I don't think I can say it quite reaches the scope of Kingdom Hearts 2's campaign. The final segment of the finale could have probably done with more actual level to explore, but I didn't expect a modern game like this to come as close to KH2 in the scope of its campaign as it does. For the most part, there are a few caveats coming up. And honestly, I feel like if you are a big fan of the post-2 spin-off plots, that's where you might feel a bit short-changed, because all that stuff seems to get wrapped up very quickly and neatly, without too much hassle or sacrifice. And myself, as a big fan of the Roxas storyline from 2, one of the plot threads from 2 feeling forced to continue here, I have mixed feelings about that plotline getting an addendum here, and spoilers, undoing that character's beautiful tragic fate in 2. An addendum which, like other resolutions in this title, feels way too easily and effortlessly concocted. Thirteen years since KH2 does mean we've had the original bittersweet ending for that plot intact for a long time, and I guess we can play Kingdom Hearts 2 and enjoy it that way without taking into account anything that takes place after it as much as we want. I'm trying not to get canon change peeved here. But I'm sure there are people who loved the ending that Roxas got in 2 like me, who are gonna be more miffed about how it's followed up on here, and I can sympathize. One day, the ending Roxas gets in 3 is gonna be the one he's had the longest, rather than the one in 2. Right now, since it's been 13 years since 2, a further resolution that undoes some of the tragedy of 2 might seem like a grand payoff for patient fans, but one day the gap between the titles will seem insignificant, and this conclusion to his arc will seem like the definitive one originally intended for him, and not the addendum to the completed story of 2 that it is. The game still ends on a kind of sad note in one regard, though, which I like, sort of reinstating the vibe the first game ended on, which is pretty cool in my book. Small spoilers, it's interesting that out of all the things that end up on a happy note in the second game, that's the thing that gets the most undone here. Appropriate, though, I think, and at least it ends the trilogy with the emphasis on the struggle of the characters from the first game. 
I think where the plot of KH3 suffers is in the fact that while it's a game trying to deal with a plotline from all these different spin-offs, all the Disney worlds are mostly new, so while half the game is spent having to introduce all these new characters and having our protagonists become friends with them, we also have loads of KH baggage to deal with. KH2 had a lot of returning Disney franchises, so so much extra constant expositing and all these introductions weren't necessary. I think the worlds that work best are the ones that take place outside of the film's plot, where the game kind of makes up its own story. The ones that take place during the movie the Disney World is based on have this awkward thing going on, where a pivotal moment from the film is happening and Sora, Donald, and Goofy are just somewhere in the background, like over there or whatever. The Pirates World is especially problematic for this as it's based on the third Pirates movie, which feels by the way like a very random thing to be recreating in 2019, but whatever. So it becomes pretty apparent that having Sora, Donald, and Goofy hang out with the cast as that plot is happening would be kind of hard to contrive. So instead, while the real Jack Sparrow is doing the plot of the film, Sora and the boys go do some unrelated busy work with a fake Jack Sparrow and then show up just for the finale of the movie. I mean, okay. <laughs> It's easy to point holes in the self-contained Disney plots here, but it's also hard not to admire the opulence of it all. I don't think I want to know how much time and money was spent on some of these cinematics. I can't help but bask in the world we live in, where somebody approved this and let them remake scenes from these movies at such a grand scale with Donald, Goofy, and a Tetsuya Nomura character in them. Using New Worlds, having to deal with all their baggage while making such a gargantuan sequel to your own convoluted story is hard, but it's the nature of making a game like this so much later than the last one you did. You want to create something fresh with brand new worlds and contemporary properties, because, you know, I think Pixar excluded, Disney has a lot more of those than they did in 2005, uh, to draw in new and old players alike. But you also have to tie up a bunch of decade-old loose ends at the same time, and that is something that KH3 can't help but wobble about while doing like an oversized tightrope walker, swaying back and forth wildly between huge chunks of Disney movie and KH lore. The fact that it does make it to the other side of that rope has, you know, at least got to be a little impressive, right? I wonder though if being so caught up in such a complicated story with all this other stuff going on means there's less time to pay attention to some of the smaller story details. Is it just me, or was the banter between the characters a lot more natural in the first game? While well, now the cast feels a lot more distant and super punished and world-weary, I guess. Maybe some people like that direction, I don't know. Everything said and done though, the main story and quest seems remarkably complete. As I write this, it's the post-game content that seems lacking, and one of the best things about KH games is usually that post-game content. There are side activities and extras to find, but from what I can tell, there's no Olympus Coliseum-style arena battle modes, or, and this kills me, no Sephiroth fight? That was something I was super hoping to see in a next-gen Kingdom Hearts game. It's sad that optional stuff isn't here, and I smell DLC on the horizon in the form of that kind of content, and, you know, maybe some actual Final Fantasy-related media in this crossover in big quotes now. But the fun of that optional stuff was that it was already in the game you bought, and you got to take on those challenges in parallel to upgrading your character in the main story. By the time a Colosseum or anything like that gets added through DLC, well, everyone who really cares is probably gonna have a level 99 Sora, right? And they might have to raise the level cap with DLC as well. But still, there are some extra fights to find and take on, and I did somehow get a lot of juice out of this game, even after beating the main stuff. I'm kind of addicted to KH combat and its systems and refining my Sora and his skills and I'm just a sucker for doing that while completing checklists. A shame I beat all the extra enemy encounters before getting Ultima though. Now I'm just this god wandering around a world full of insects squashing everything I see. Going home to dine at night on gourmet food like an opulent lord. But so empty on the inside with nobody to challenge me. Ratatouille, bro, I just don't need this insane amount of food. And, and recipes you got. I'm sorry. It's very charming, but even on proud mode, I just never needed the buffs from this stuff. This is another issue with taking so long to bring out a game. Uh, your player base has been playing the same game again and again for over a decade, like Conan pushing that wheel on repeat for years. Uh, they're gonna be pretty overpowered by the time you offer up a new challenge. Sorry, I'm going off the rails here. I didn't really want this to be a mechanical look at the game, really. I'm not really ready to speak on that. I think what's in the game is pretty cool, though. It's Kingdom Hearts 2's awesome combat with added elements here and there that offer up a deluge of options. 
Really, if I'm going to go in-depth into mechanics with such a mechanically iterative title, I'd rather also talk about 2's systems and therefore also 1's systems first. Rather, I wanted this to be a look at what it's like for a video game to take so long to come out and some of my raw emotions, you know. And if we are going to bring up the combat, I think it is Kingdom Hearts 3's ambition to be this epic, glorious return that might hurt the gameplay verdicts the most. The easiness of it all is probably the biggest issue. You get super powerful moves pretty easily, and I worry that will dissuade some players from getting into the more satisfying stuff. Landing a good counter and blasting out an aerial combo in regular combat is usually where the actual fun lies, rather than mashing into a big cutscene event. They don't require you to do much to activate them, and once they are, they necessitate very limited to no interaction. It's as if the game is perhaps a little too preoccupied with making sure all players see just how impressive and epic looking this video game return can be after so long. Which can overshadow the mechanics that are actually a little more fun to experiment with. Thankfully, this stuff is generally optional. But if you're like me and you like to use everything at your disposal to succeed, you're gonna find the game a bit easy. Kingdom Hearts 2 had a lot of flashy stuff as well, but that stuff never felt like it overpowered the gameplay to me as much as the audacious, crazy stuff does in Kingdom Hearts 3. It's like the game is handing out amazing looking stuff at very little cost. And that's not to say you can't do cool stuff with some of the more flashier moves. I just wish the game didn't peter out and become so easy, so I have more to test my newly accrued skills on by game's end. You have so much added mobility and options in the moment to moment, but it feels like they designed Sora to play this way without adequately providing challenges for him to ultimately use them against. But I guess we'll always have level 1 only runs, right? The worry I get with franchises taking so long out and doing these epic returns is the inclination to play it safe. Kingdom Hearts has had its subversive moments, but KH3, from my initial reading story-wise, seems a lot more focused on just giving a conclusion to the expanded universe elements and delivering on a classic adventure as diplomatically as possible, with the results, as I said, being an exciting and engaging finale. But one that, at least in terms of plot and with its easy resolutions, tries to deliver what I think Square thought the majority of players wanted in most areas, and maybe not a lot in the way of things people might not have known they wanted, and could have made for even more interesting and memorable stuff. And there are bits of the ending which I do think are gonna leave players with a bit of a melancholic feeling, and aren't exactly, you know, super happy in what everybody would want. But a lot of the game's plot does feel a little bit safe. And I can see why playing it safe and epic may have been a solid idea when a franchise returned fake out, like Travis Strikes Again played things so subversively and was misunderstood by a lot of people. Perhaps it was the right time to make an exciting new game that didn't try to rock the boat with anything too crazy and subversive, and ultimately it's still a game for me as a pretty jaded Kingdom Hearts fan, that delivered on some spectacular moments later on, that merged action gameplay and story and artistic talent and glorious presentation with music and production value that only a massive endeavor like this could provide to giddying results. The fact that they developed another big home console Kingdom Hearts after so many years and one that doesn't feel like it needed to bow down to any new design trend, one that feels like a game from its era, I, I think that deserves some credits, you know? Even if the story pacing and some of the resolutions feel a bit off here and there. I respect it for staying the course in a lot of regards and trying to make what feels like a game gameplay and design-wise for the people who loved the older titles and love that old design. In that sense, this is Kingdom Hearts 3. And that feels good to say. A final hurrah and adventure for a trio, a trinity, who if you're my age and like me were a big deal in our youths, right? One last reminder that these characters who left a positive mark on us can still be with us in some capacity even today. That's a nice feeling and kind of the message of all of Kingdom Hearts, right? It's easy to point out how the juxtaposition between the interactions of characters intended to appeal to all ages and the complex tapestry of dark lore associated with the original Kingdom Hearts content has always been the culprit for the more awkward series moments, but that's also why it kind of works. 
Of course, it comes off as childish and silly to just take the stories of the Disney worlds at face value. I'm not like a huge Disney guy who's seen all of these films, but isn't it kind of the point that we interact with these Disney characters from our respective youths for a dose of optimism and innocence before we face the more dark and twisted foreboding stuff at the end of these games? They help us out, but ultimately can only really follow us in spirit to the final challenges. In a series about adolescence and coming of age, isn't that kind of an analog for growing up? You can't rely on those simplistic and optimistic vibes from when you're young totally forever. You're gonna have to face the dark realities of life at some point, but those things from our past can still impact us in a positive way, and this whole series is a nice reminder of that. Especially when innocent characters like Donald and Goofy do stick around until the end by your side. Even in the darkest of times. I think that's the positive message Kingdom Hearts is going for, right? If you played KH2 when you were becoming a teen, like me, that reassurance was definitely nice back then. You know, everyone has a dodgy time as a teenager. And hey, as an adult, it's not exactly bad reassurance now either. Times ain't exactly perfect. That's what I think the overall arcs of these games, going to Disney worlds and then facing dark Final Fantasy-style challenges later, represents and symbolizes. A nice gradient of tone that reflects the gradient of tone in our lives. Early bits of that gradient lingering on the steeper it gets. And that's melancholic stuff to think about, right? So it's good that if there's one thing Kingdom Hearts is a master of, it's melancholy. That comes across in its music, the design of its bosses, and the story as a whole. And light ending spoilers here. At the end of Kingdom Hearts 3, when your buddies Donald and Goofy call on you one last time to wake you up and defeat the bad guy, yeah. Donald and Goofy are basically the stand-ins for our pasts and the simpler times. Coming back in the nick of time, at the last moment, with some reassurance that we're doing the right thing, and that Sora and the player can push through and make it to the end. It felt like the entire message of this series encapsulated in one moment. And I think it's no coincidence that after those events, Sora signs off from the trilogy with a new adult resolve. We've kind of gone from childhood in the first game, to adolescence in the second, to adulthood here at the end of this one. Sora's demeanor at the end matching that transformation. What can I say? It's just, it's great to play what seems like a fairly completed title by the person who started that exact same series 17 years ago. I keep my expectations low these days, and I feel like for good reason. The previous gen and its leftovers were filled with half jobs, but now with both Travis Strikes Again and Kingdom Hearts, I've been taken aback by how much I've ended up feeling for these franchise comebacks, having such a great time after prior disappointments. I'm glad I avoided all the trailers with the new songs in them, so I got to hear them for the first time in the game. I don't think they would have hit me as hard if I hadn't. I can't overstate how much I enjoyed the finale to Kingdom Hearts 3. I'm two for two on these franchise comebacks so far this year, and I'm having a good time, guys. So catch you again soon. You know what's next.